La batalla que liberó a Gran Bretaña de la amenaza de invasión de los ejércitos de Napoleón Bonaparte no fue librada en tierra, sino en el mar. En una sangrienta y brutal contienda, no muy lejos del puerto español de Cádiz, la combinación de las fuerzas francesas del almirante Villeneuve y la flota española fue derrotada sin remedio por naves británicas al mando del almirante Lord Nelson, el más grande héroe naval de esa nación. La batalla más famosa de la historia naval se libró un tranquilo día de octubre de 1805 en Trafalgar. La batalla de Trafalgar, 1805. El Tratado de Amiens, firmado el 25 de marzo de 1802, estableció entre Gran Bretaña y Francia una frágil paz que duró poco más de un año. Napoleón detestaba a los británicos, cuya victoria en la batalla del Nilo en 1801 había terminado con su campaña en el Medio Oriente. El tratado no fue más que un intervalo entre guerras, durante el cual el emperador reconstruyó su armada y preparó planes detallados para invadir Inglaterra. Para el año 1803, al reanudarse las hostilidades entre ambos países, Napoleón había formado una armada impresionante y el temor británico a una invasión francesa estaba aumentando día tras día. El clamor del pueblo británico por una respuesta tangible ante el renovado militarismo francés obligó a hacer mejoras significativas de las defensas terrestres del país. Gran Bretaña, al igual que Napoleón, se dedicó a fortalecer su armada. 20.000 hombres adicionales fueron reclutados solo en 1803, principalmente mediante el alistamiento de marineros mercantes y en un frenesí de construcción naval, se fabricaron 80 nuevos buques de guerra durante un periodo de solo 12 meses. Incluso sin esta rápida expansión de su flota, a principios del siglo XIX, Gran Bretaña ya poseía la armada más profesional del mundo, con marineros experimentados, disciplinados y con un entrenamiento de primera clase que los convertía en una gran fuerza de combate. There are a number of ways of judging the efficiency of a navy, and I think we should start looking at the officers. The, the officers of the Royal Navy had all known each other for a very long time. They actually started together as midshipmen, around about the age of 10, 11, 12. And so by the time they, they, they reach the rank of captain, that they have been at sea for about 30 years. And that meant that you had an officer corps with a tremendous amount of seafaring experience and a lot of gunnery skill. The French, on the other hand, remember, had just had a revolution. And they they just spent a lot of time slaughtering all their aristocrats. And the French Royal Navy, from before the revolution, had been a very aristocratic organization. When all of those who had any form of noble connection had fled the country in order to avoid being guillotined or any of the other penalties brought upon those of the old regime, as they had been called. As a result, Admiral Villeneuve and his senior officers, you might say, belonged to the second or even the third eleven of French naval commanders. And what was not particularly good, strong at the top tended to be reflected all the way down. También, tácticamente, los británicos y los franceses pensaban de modo muy diferente. Las tácticas francesas durante la batalla solían ser defensivas y limitarse a evitarle daños a sus propios barcos, ya que preferían aumentar sus oportunidades de escapar a las de esforzarse en lograr una victoria firme. Once the French realized that they could no longer mix it in, in a general action with the Royal Navy, they decided what they would do is actually try and immobilize a British man of war. When they were going to fire their guns, a French gunner would fire as the ship rolled up, which meant that the French gunner was shooting for the enemy's rigging. So the French always shot to impair the mobility of their enemies, whereas the British shot for the hull to actually try to sink their enemies. 
the Royal Navy had maintained its tradition of going for, for guns which were essentially ship killers. And, and, and these reached their apogee in, in the Caron Arm. This was a gun like, like it looked like a, an enormous mortar. And, and it was actually manufactured, these guns were manufactured in the, the Scottish town of, of Caron, and hence they were called the Caron Arm. It was also known in the Royal Navy as a smasher and by the French as a devil gun because the amount of damage it could do. It was fired when quite close to the enemy ships. Uh, and they fired 68 pound shot, uh, very powerful weapons, but short range. Uh, and this was the first cannon to be shot by, a vi by victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. De las diversas tácticas utilizadas para causar daños a las naves enemigas y matar a quienes estuvieran a bordo, barrer con un barco era una de las más efectivas. Para poder lograrlo, se requería que un navío alcanzara la popa de un barco enemigo, desde donde podía disparar las balas de sus cañones, de popa a proa. And that allowed you to concentrate your entire broadside against the, the area of the, his ship where he was weakest, where he couldn't actually maximize his firepower and you could maximize yours. Anything in the ship that can be hit gets hit. You're firing right through the stern of the ship, then you can hit anything on that ship. You can hit all three masts if you want. De no ser posible realizar las complicadas maniobras necesarias para barrer un barco al fragor de la batalla, las naves lucharían de costado a costado, con balas de cañón disparadas directamente contra una nave enemiga. The broadside had evolved as the, the commonest form of engaging an enemy ship. It had been evolving since the, the 16th century. And essentially what, what one did was to bring oneself parallel to the, the enemy ship. And then you opened up with, with your cannon. The disadvantage of the broadside is that it took a very, very long time to have any impact on the enemy ship. It was absolutely astonishing the amount of punishment that, that say, a three-decker with very thick teak decks and a, and a thick teak hull could, could actually sustain. Cuando Nelson escribió en su famoso memorando antes de Trafalgar que ningún capitán podría equivocarse si coloca su barco al costado del barco enemigo, se expresaba por experiencia propia. Había visto los efectos de una descarga de costado en el interior totalmente destruido del recinto de cañones de un buque de guerra. Cannon from other ships firing in, into the ship's side would basically break it up into vicious and very large splinters and these flying around the lower gun decks would cause absolute mayhem and very severe and unpleasant injuries to the men, um, often causing death, but more often than not causing um, very um, severe mutilation. English gun crews were able to serve their guns much faster than French gun crews, largely because of their level of training, and they were, uh, they were better shots than their French counterparts. The guns were all muzzle loaders, but they were able to fire different types of ammunition depending on what they were trying to do. They fired round solid shot for structural damage. They then fired bar shot, which was basically two cannonballs locked together by a steel bar, which actually went spinning through the air to damage the masts. There was then chain shot, which was basically a cannonball cut in half, linked together by a piece of chain, which was when fired out of the cannon would go spinning through the air to damage sails and rigging. And finally, they had a thing called grape shot, which was a metal plate with nine two-pound cannonballs wrapped together with canvas and string. This was a, an anti-personnel weapon, as when they fi were fired out of the cannon, uh, the canvas and string burnt away, and then dis just splayed out these small cannonballs over the opposition's deck. And they usually fired these when they saw boarding parties mustering on the opposition's uh, decks. Los británicos eran temibles oponentes al momento de abordar una nave. En una famosa ocasión, los 50 hombres que constituían la tripulación del Speedy lograron superar y derrotar una nave tripulada por más de 300 marineros franceses. Sin embargo, con mucha frecuencia, un barco arriaba su bandera y se rendía antes de que sus hombres llegaran al combate cuerpo a cuerpo. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, such as inboarding actions, was a very brutal and personal man-to-man -man battle in which basically anything which could cause 
um, hurt or injury to another human being was used, whether it be a cutlass, an axe, a musket, the bayonet, the boarding pikes, clubs, bits of wood, anything they could um, hurl or hit another man with would be used in trying to take control of an enemy ship. Las tácticas generales de combates navales durante la era de las velas se derivaban de consideraciones prácticas. El hecho de que los cañones estuvieran instalados principalmente a lo largo de los costados de la nave implicaba que ésta no podía avanzar fácilmente y dispararle al enemigo al mismo tiempo. Los barcos solían luchar en una sola línea, al costado del enemigo, como en las batallas de Copenhagen y el Nilo en 1801. Uh, the line was designed to, to maximize your firepower. If you could get your, your, your men of war in, in a continuous line, then, then they could have all their broadsides directed at, at you as you were coming towards them. La línea de batalla también era una excelente formación defensiva, ya que si los barcos permanecían en un orden cerrado, se reducían las probabilidades de que el enemigo rompiera la línea. When you break the enemy's line with your ships, you are sailing in between them. That means that as you pass between two enemy ships, both sides of your ship can rake the ship to either side of you. Desde 1803, Napoleón había estado reuniendo a sus ejércitos en Boulogne en espera del momento adecuado para atravesar el Canal de la Mancha. En los dos años que habían pasado, ese momento no había llegado y los campamentos se habían convertido en poblados semipermanentes. One of the problems of having a fleet inactive is, is that the crew lose their edge. Uh, training in harbour, you know, cannot be equated to training at sea. There is simply no way that, that it's comparable. Uh, one of the other problems of being in harbour all the time is that you will have desertion. Crews will go ashore. Some will decide that they're bored and, and want to go somewhere else. Uh, others will, will actually quite like being in harbour and they will actually form liaisons in, in the town, they will get drunk. Uh, generally, they, they become very sloppy, very fat and, and very lazy. Uh, you have to compare the state of the, the French in, and the Spanish in, in Cadiz Harbour with the, the, the state of the, the Royal Navy, the, those storm-battered ships uh, which have been training relentlessly for 22 months. Cada semana que pasaba, Napoleón se tornaba aún más impaciente, ya que sus planes estaban siendo frustrados y arruinados por Sir William Cornwallis, cuyos barcos imponían un bloqueo en cada puerto, entre Press y el Ferrol. Y también por Cuthbert Collingwood, quien había logrado asegurar el puerto de Cádiz. Además, la flota británica estaba a las órdenes supremas de un hombre que desde hace mucho tiempo atrás había sido una piedra en el calzado del emperador, Horacio Nelson. Horatio Nelson was without the least doubt very much the greatest hero produced by the British Isles in these long and difficult Napoleonic wars. Perhaps his greatest quality was the way he was able to inspire everybody from his under admirals and his captains all the way down to the ordinary seamen and the marines with a sense of being part of a brotherhood and a very exclusive brotherhood at that. He looked after his people and as a result his people thought very highly of him. Nelson's subordinates worshipped him. And one of the most striking things about Nelson is that his subordinates feared to disappoint him. They didn't want to do anything which would cause him to think less of them. And that kind of loyalty you can only get from providing very impressive leadership. N Nelson was a gambler, just like Bonaparte. And he would take the most astonishing risks. The Battle of the Nile, for example. No sane man would have done what he did at the Battle of the Nile. But Nelson, like Napoleon, had the ability to calculate the risks. And he said famously that, 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 that no battle at sea can be fought without an element of risk. So he took chances. The great American historian Mann wrote of Nelson that he was the embodiment of sea power. And I think you can say that is true, a very good comment for the purpose. 
En diciembre de 1804, tras meses de negociaciones en los que no faltaron amenazas, se firmó un acuerdo formal entre Francia y España, el cual llevó a España a la guerra del lado francés. Con esta fuerza adicional, los aliados prepararon un plan detallado para desviar a la flota británica lejos de sus aguas nacionales hacia el Caribe, lo cual le daba tiempo suficiente a los ejércitos de Napoleón para atravesar el canal y comenzar su invasión a Inglaterra. Se propuso que Villeneuve navegara hacia las Indias Occidentales, lo cual seguramente atraería a Nelson para que las fuerzas de Villeneuve se unieran a las del almirante Missisi y el almirante Gantam. Esta enorme flota volvería luego a Europa y haría su parte en la invasión. The minute you look at the West Indies diversion plan, you know it was not put together by a sailor. This was Napoleon's plan. This was a plan put together by somebody who could actually calculate the rate of march of an army. And so Napoleon, when he looked at it, said, you know, I can get an army from, from Boulogne to, to Austerlitz in, in so many days or, or so many weeks. I'll do the same with a fleet. I'll, I'll draw the British off, I'll take them over to the West Indies, and then I'll cross the Channel. Easy. Well, no, it's not easy. You can't do it, Napoleon. I'm sorry. You know, you might be able to do it in the age of steam and the age of the radio, but you can't do it in the age of sail power. It's simply not possible. As well, the West Indies gambit assumed that the combined French and Spanish fleet could get out of the harbor uh, and, and, and actually sail off to the West Indies. And that just wasn't an option. They, uh, they couldn't just sail out the harbor. They were being blockaded. Todos los intentos franceses de escapar habían fracasado. El más reciente, el día de Año Nuevo de 1805, se había realizado con un clima atroz. Pero el 30 de marzo, Villeneuve logró abrirse paso a través del bloqueo de Nelson. De acuerdo con el plan, navegó a toda velocidad hacia Martinica, en las Indias Occidentales. Posteriormente, Nelson persiguió a la flota francesa. Hasta entonces, todo marchaba según el plan. Por desgracia para Villeneuve, este no había contado con la velocidad con la que Nelson haría el viaje. Una travesía que le llevó a Villeneuve seis semanas y lo dejó con mil hombres enfermos, fue realizada por Nelson en solo tres semanas, con hombres aptos y preparados para el combate al llegar a su destino. La temprana llegada de Nelson tomó a Villeneuve totalmente por sorpresa, ya que aún no había logrado unir sus fuerzas a las flotas de Missisi y Gantom. Aterrado, levó anclas hacia aguas europeas, pero Nelson, totalmente consciente del plan francés, se dirigió a Gibraltar. Ignorando las órdenes de Napoleón de navegar al norte de Francia, Villeneuve navegó posteriormente al sur, al puerto de Cádiz, donde se vio bloqueado de inmediato, una vez más por Collingwood y Cornwallis. El plan francés para librarse de la armada británica había tenido un comienzo particularmente desfavorable. The French Navy could not allow the state of affairs to continue. Napoleon said, I need to have a few days free of the Royal Navy in which I can go over and invade Britain. He was very insistent that the French Navy actually leave port and fight. On the other hand, would do the French no good if the entire French fleet went to the bottom, or worse, was taken over as prizes by the Royal Navy. So, the French were in the awkward position of either staying in port and failing or coming out of port and failing. Napoleon was always very impatient about the problems which his sailors face. He could not really allow or conceive that a matter of the wind blowing in the wrong direction or a strong current would make it frankly impossible for them on certain occasions to reach a certain rendezvous on the exact date he had laid down in his overall orders. There is one example of how callous he could be where sailors were concerned or the naval element was concerned relating to the camp of Boulogne on the 20th of July 1804 when in spite of the onset of an onshore gale and against the complete advice of his admirals who were present, one of whom indeed Admiral Bruy, he sacked on the spot for criticizing, he ordered an invasion review of shipping and troops to go in front of him on the shoreline resulting in 20 sloops being dashed ashore and 2,000 soldiers drowned. And then Napoleon just apparently stamped off back to his quarters without another word. Napoleón había perdido toda su paciencia con Villeneuve, 
El 16 de septiembre, plenamente convencido de que la negativa del almirante a dejar Cádiz estaba influenciada por su propia cobardía, el emperador le ordenó zarpar de Nápoles. Nuestra intención consiste en que si encuentra al enemigo en inferioridad de fuerzas, usted lo atacará sin vacilación e intentará superarlo a toda costa, le indicó Napoleón. Pero para el ocaso del 16 de septiembre, la flota francesa aún no había zarpado para enfrentarse a ningún enemigo, ni inferior ni superior. Al día siguiente, Napoleón, encolerizado con Villeneuve, decidió reemplazarlo por el vicealmirante Rossili, quien fue enviado de inmediato a Cádiz para hacerse cargo de la flota. Por desgracia, Rossili no llegó a tiempo para asumir el mando en Trafalgar, ya que Villeneuve, finalmente obligado a entrar en acción por la designación de Rossili, decidió obedecer al emperador y zarpó del puerto el 18 de octubre. Villeneuve jumped the gun. The, the reason he decided to sail out on the 19th of October, 1805, is that he knew that another admiral was being sent from France to take his job. And so Villeneuve decided that, that what he would do was before this, this other admiral arrived, have a victory over the British. What he would do was overwhelm what he imagined to be the, the, the small British blockading squadron, win a local victory, and then sail on into the Mediterranean. And then it would be one in the eye for, for his critic, Napoleon Bonaparte. Faltaban muy pocas horas para la batalla de Trafalgar. Nelson realized that there would be a large number of capital ships within each fleet. And to get a conclusive victory, something that could uh, be finished in one day, he decided that he had to employ something totally different to anything normally experienced at those times. And he came up with the tactic of attacking the, Fren or the French and Spanish line from the sides. Nelson disposed his fleet in, in two columns and proposed to sail directly at, at the, the Franco-Spanish line. Now, now, this flew in the face of conventional naval wisdom. Uh, what this meant is, is that for a period, the, the two British columns would, would get the full force of the Franco-Spanish broadsides. But what it would mean is that if they survived those broadsides, that they would then be able to break the, the Franco-Spanish line. They were going to run right into the French line of battle, so that on the left, Nelson hit the French line of battle dead center. Collingwood hit the French line of battle off on the right. And half of the French line would just keep on going, sailing away from the battle. And while half the fleet was trying to turn around and come back, which is very difficult to do in a sailing ship, Nelson and Collingwood would be, would be beating up the rest of the French fleet and destroying it. A las 6 de la mañana del 21 de octubre de 1805, la flota británica estaba formada en dos columnas, según lo planeado. La primera columna, de 15 naves, estaba al mando de Collingwood, a bordo del Royal Sovereign, y la segunda, que consistía de 12 barcos, estaba a las órdenes de Nelson a bordo del Victory. Mientras navegaban hacia los aliados, Nelson dio la señal, preparados para la batalla, y los hombres de la flota británica se dispusieron a entrar en combate. El mobiliario fue bien guardado y los artículos innecesarios fueron arrojados al agua. Se prepararon armas cortas, se extinguió el fuego de la estufa y el puente fue cubierto de arena. A las 8 de la mañana, Villeneuve emitió una orden que asombró a los oficiales y los hombres de ambas flotas. Hizo que sus naves alteraran su curso y dieran marcha atrás hacia Cádiz. Confusos y ya completamente desmoralizados, los hombres de la flota aliada le dieron vuelta a sus naves, despacio y gradualmente, mientras a cada instante las naves de Nelson se acercaban más y más. El gran almirante podía palpar la confusión reinante en las naves aliadas y estaba decidido a impedir su retirada a Cádiz. La flota está condenada. El almirante francés no sabe lo que está haciendo, señaló un capitán español al contemplar la escena. Ciertamente, era un resumen exacto de lo que le esperaba a la flota aliada. Villeneuve wasn't incompetent, he just wasn't up to the job. But there were no serving 
French admirals sufficiently young and energetic to actually take up a command like this except Villeneuve. So Villeneuve was the one they sent. And he hated it. He knew he wasn't up to this job. And ever since the Battle of the Nile, he'd been personally afraid of Nelson. When you read about Villeneuve, you get the feeling that he must have woken up screaming in the night that Nelson was going to come and get him. He had a fear of Lord Nelson. He was the best the French had. And had Villeneuve been, been serving in the, in the Royal Navy, serving with British crews on, on, on a British ship, he would have been the equal of, of, of any number of, of Nelson's lieutenants. But he wasn't. He was serving with the French Navy. And he, he had to do the best he could with the materials at, at hand. Ambas columnas británicas continuaron navegando hacia las desmoralizadas líneas aliadas. Nelson se desplazaba por la vanguardia y Collingwood por la retaguardia. Más aún, la astutamente táctica de Nelson le hacía buscar otras formas de obtener ventaja sobre su enemigo. Si puedo, lo embestiré de una sola vez, aproximadamente a un tercio de la línea de su nave líder. Pienso que así confundiré y sorprenderé al enemigo. Eso causará una batalla desordenada, y eso es lo que deseo. He positioned Victory where he wanted her. Victory was the fla his flagship. And so he decided that his ship would lead the line and obviously be in the most uh, difficult or most precarious position to be damaged as they broke through. And as they were approaching, uh, Captain Hardy, who was the captain of Victory, said to Nelson, where would you like me to break through, sir? And he said, I don't care, just aim for the nearest ship. A las 11 y 25 de la mañana, Nelson dio su famosa señal. Inglaterra espera que cada hombre cumpla con su deber, la cual fue recibida con una inmensa alegría en las naves británicas. Now, one would assume that this signal actually stirred emotions right throughout the fleet, and, and on some ships it did, it was greeted with cheering, but on the Royal Sovereign, Admiral Collingwood, who was Nelson's second in command, got very, very annoyed. <laughs> and then he was reported as saying when he read the signal, he said, I do wish Nelson would stop sending these signals. We quite well know what to do. A las 11 y 40 de la mañana, Nelson dio su señal final. Pienso romper o atravesar la línea enemiga para impedirle entrar a Cádiz. El movimiento del almirante era seguido por el Red Oak que cerraba la brecha entre él y el Busentor, lo que le negaba al Victory el espacio necesario para abrirse paso y barrer a su adversario. El propio Victory estaba bajo un intenso fuego de costado por parte del Red Oak y el Santísima Trinidad, el cual, aunque no había roto la línea, ya no podía volver atrás. Victory did receive some severe damage. Uh, the majority of the foremast was taken away. Part of the mainmast was also damaged. And so Victory lost a lot of her uh, sailing capacity. Mientras tanto, al sureste de Nelson y el Victory, el Royal Sovereign de Collingwood se convirtió en la primera nave británica en alcanzar la línea enemiga. A pesar de estar bajo intenso fuego, se enfrentó al buque insignia español Santa Ana, que era el mayor barco de guerra de su época. Tras reservar su fuego hasta estar al costado de su enemigo, el Royal Sovereign disparó una descarga directamente hacia el Santa Ana, a muy corta distancia, la cual causó terribles daños y produjo innumerables bajas. Fue un inmenso éxito para Collingwood y la flota británica, pero el Royal Sovereign se vio sometido rápidamente al intenso fuego del San Justo y el San Leandro. Fue solo la oportuna llegada del Belial, del Capitán Harwood, con el Mars y el Tonan, muy de cerca, lo que ayudó a las naves francesas. El Royal Sovereign continuó su destrucción implacable del buque insignia español hasta las 2 y 15 de la tarde, cuando sus tres mástiles habían sido destruidos y se rindió a Collingwood. 340 marineros españoles habían muerto o resultado heridos durante el ataque. El Royal Sovereign también presentaba graves daños y 141 muertos o heridos de gravedad que yacían en cubierta. El viento en el día de la batalla era algo más que una brisa, lo que significaba que las flotas enemigas solo podían navegar lentamente hacia sus adversarios. The lack of wind had a very considerable effect on how the Battle of Trafalgar was actually fought. 
First of all, you have Collingwood's column on the right coming into action and being fully engaged for a complete hour before Nelson and the left-hand column were able to come up. Essentially, they were just drifting along towards the enemy with very few ways which they could adopt to speed their rate of progress at all. In any case, almost all vessels would have put on battle sail, as it was called, reducing their amount of canvas before coming into the actual uh, engagement line. So there was very little he could do about this, and though it dictated really the stages of the battle, we could say. A medida que realizaba su lento avance, el Victory, que había sufrido graves daños, aún estaba bajo el intenso fuego del Redo Tower y el Bus en Tour. Con 50 hombres muertos, aún no estaba en condiciones de responder al ataque. Finalmente, a la una de la tarde, el Victory rompió la línea aliada y estuvo en posición de barrer al Bus en Tour, lo cual hizo con efectos devastadores y dejó al barco francés seriamente dañado y arrojando un espeso humo negro. Uh, as Victory broke through the line, uh, she did that at the stern of the French ship, the Boussenteur. Um, she then was trying to sort, uh, her crew were trying to sort out the, the sails that had been dropped, the masts that were falling around the deck. And as they did so, they actually came alongside the next ship that was following on from the Boussenteur, the Red Etable. And to the point that the ships became locked together. And it was own victory was actually being to some degree overrun. Incluso en su desesperada posición, los franceses le dispararon a los aparejos del Victory, mientras la nave británica lanzaba su fuego en el casco y la cubierta del navío francés. Entonces, a la una y veinticinco de la tarde, se produjo el evento más dramático. Uh, when Nelson was hit, uh, uh, he was walking uh, on the quarterdeck, pacing, pacing the quarterdeck with, with Hardy. There was very little else for him to do. He just had to let the men see that he was there to, in order to maintain their, their fighting spirit. Now, Nelson didn't wear a uniform coat. Nelson wore a, uh, a ratty old frock coat. But Nelson was a knight of four different orders of knighthood. And he had the badges of all four orders of knighthood embroidered on his frock coat. So he was a straightforward target. He wasn't wearing an admiral's uniform, but he was wearing a coat that anybody in the world could distinguish. Nelson had just turned at the hatchway and, and, and was facing aft, and a ball came straight down from the redoubtable, hit him in the left shoulder, and, and, and passed right through his body, and then penetrated the, the spine. And, and Nelson, as he was being raised up, said to Hardy, they have done for me at last, Hardy. My backbone is shot through. And of that, Nelson was carried from the deck. Nelson, herido de muerte, fue llevado al recinto de popa del Victory, que estaba repleto de marineros muertos o agonizantes en un escenario que fue luego comparado al interior de una carnicería por el capellán del barco, Alexander Scott. En medio de esta pesadilla de miembros mutilados y cuerpos destrozados, el almirante Nelson agonizaba. Wounded sailors and officers on a man of war were treated far, far below the decks in the cockpit of the ship. And the surgeons worked down there, and it was a scene of, of horror. Uh, Lord Nelson was taken down, carried like a babe in, in arms by, by a marine, taken down to the cockpit. And the surgeon said, uh, I'm going to try to, to save you, my lord. And Nelson said, don't waste your time on me. I am going to die. I feel my, my uh, spine is severed. I felt the ball break my back. Uh, and he said he felt uh, bleeding in him every time he breathed. And he said he was finished. Don't bother with me, says Nelson. Go look after the guys you can save. A las dos de la tarde, el Red Octavo finalmente se rindió tras arriar su bandera. Tras ser rodeado por el Victory, a babor, y el Temerén a estribor, su valeroso capitán, Jean-Jacques Lucas, y su tripulación habían luchado con coraje. El Red Octavo había entrado a la batalla con 643 oficiales y hombres. 
Mientras el malherido Luca entregaba su espada en señal de rendición, no podía saber que 487 de sus hombres estaban muertos y que otros 81 eran víctimas de heridas mortales. Solo 75 de ellos estaban aptos para tripular la nave. The British were not having it all their own way. I mean, it's notorious that the victory uh, was almost dead in the water. It was for all intents and purposes just, just a hulk by three o'clock in the afternoon. So, so badly damaged had it been by, by the, the fire of the, the redoubtable. Uh, Collingwood's royal sovereign had suffered the most enormous punishment. It had actually been surrounded by, by five French and Spanish ships and had been pounded. But the Spanish and the French, mercifully, had been hurting each other just as much as they'd been hurting royal sovereign. A la 1 y 45 de la tarde, Villeneuve le había hecho señales al Formidable en la vanguardia aliada para ordenarle desesperadamente que navegara para ayudar al resto de la flota. El almirante Dumanois, al mando del Formidable y a la cabeza de al menos 10 barcos no afectados en su división, decidió ignorar la señal del almirante. The behavior of Dumanois is one of the, the big imponderables of that day. What was he about? Why didn't he put about more, more rapidly and more quickly? Was he a coward? Or, or was there something else motivating him? I do not believe he was a coward. And I don't think historians, on my whole, think that Dumanois uh, lacked the, the stomach for a fight. Dumanois hated Villeneuve. That there was an enormous conflict between the two men. Uh, there'd been a rivalry going back years. And Dumanois had a very good idea that Villeneuve was trying to pull off a, a, a victory Uh, in order to, to boost his own position and his struggle with Napoleon Bonaparte, that, that indeed there had been a, a, another naval officer on his way to, to actually take command of the Franco-Spanish uh, fleet, and that Villeneuve had, 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 for his own personal advancement, brought on this battle. Fue solo a las 2 y 30 de la tarde que accedió con renuencia a entrar en combate, momento en el cual tan solo le quedaban cinco barcos, el Rayo, el San Francisco de Asís, y el Helos se habían dirigido al norte, lo más lejos posible de la batalla, mientras que el San Agustín y el Intepid se lo habían tomado muy a pecho y habían navegado en dirección a la lucha. Dumanoir didn't have enough wind to turn quickly, so he um, he was able to actually turn his ships, but to get back to the scene of the battle, he didn't have enough wind to do that. So he was slowly crawling back. I mean, this is, these are sailing ships. Without the wind, they cannot move at all. He's only got a gentle breeze, and he's got to get back as fast as he can to the scene of the battle. He just couldn't do it. Finalmente, la reducida división de Dumanois llegó tres horas después de haberse iniciado la batalla, y no lo hizo nada bien. El Mont Blanc y el Intrepid lograron embestirse el uno al otro, mientras el Neptune se hallaba entre el Minotaur y el Espachier, que abrió fuego sobre él hasta rendirse a las 5 y 10 de la tarde. My 3 p.m. Dumanoir was attacking the Spartiate and the Minotaur. And there was a general melee. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of ball going from ship to ship. A lot of ships were grappled together with, with boarding parties roaring back and forth between them. And there was no way to know which way the battle was going to go. El propio Dumanoir se llevó sus barcos restantes más allá del alcance de la flota británica. A las 4 y 15 de la tarde, después del más terrible tratamiento por parte del navío Leviatán, el Bucentor, con Villeneuve a bordo, arrió su bandera. Tan grandes eran sus daños y pérdidas que su rendición ante el capitán del Conqueror fue efectuada por solo un oficial y cinco tripulantes. El Leviatán también dio cuenta del San Agustín, que perdió casi 400 hombres. En severo contraste, solo 26 hombres del Leviatán fueron muertos o heridos durante la batalla. La bitácora del HMS Victory señala que un fuego parcial continuó hasta las 4 y 30, cuando tras otorgársele la victoria al honorable Lord Visconde Nelson cabe él murió por sus heridas. Después de casi tres horas, el almirante finalmente había perdido la vida en la hora de su mayor victoria. El lugar donde murió es ahora un santuario en su memoria. Nelson's death is one of the, the best recorded deaths of, of all time. It has come into the, the consciousness of, of, of the British people. 
everyone knows that that Nelson's final words, just about his last words, were, were, were kiss me hearty. They'd known each other all their lives. And, 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 th and this was a brother leaving the band of brothers. And he'd lived long enough to give his orders at the beginning of the battle. Um, one of the last orders he gave before the battle was everyone should drop anchor as soon as the battle was over so the fleet wouldn't be scattered. And ironically, that order was carried out right after he died. During the battle when Nelson was shot, he ordered that his face be covered whilst he was carried down to the all-op deck to be um, cared for. Even then, he was aware that um, his personality was a great boon to the morale of the Royal Navy, and he didn't want to reduce the fighting efficiency of HMS Victory, hence asking for the handkerchief over his face. When he died, as word got out through first Victory and then through the rest of the ship, and then eventually, of course, when the news reached um, England, you cannot really imagine um, just how such a blow was received by the sailors because they really thought he was invincible and he would lead them on um, to greater victories. Usually uh, when the British people heard of a great victory there was a great deal of rejoicing. Uh, the usual guns were fired in the parks and in, in the tower. Uh, however, this time there was a great sense of loss because they, they'd heard that Nelson had died. Um, there wasn't this joyous celebration. They felt that even though they'd won this great victory, a large percentage of the French and Spanish fleet had either been captured or sunk, uh, but they felt a great deal of loss because Nelson, their hero, had died. La batalla de Trafalgar terminó a las 5 y 45 de la tarde, cuando el barco imperial francés, Aquil, desapareció tras una enorme explosión que mató a casi 500 hombres. Fue el último y sangriento acto de un día terrible, y en toda la flota comenzó el solemne y lúgubre proceso de atender a los heridos e inspeccionar los daños de los barcos. The French and Spanish fleet lost more than 4,000 dead, 4,408 dead, and, uh, and about 2,500 wounded. That's an approximate figure for the, the combined French and Spanish fleets. The British fleet lost 449 dead, so roughly a tenth that the combined French and Spanish fleet suffered, and 1,200 or so wounded, roughly half what the combined French and Spanish fleets suffered. To a great extent, this is because British gunners fired at French hulls. That meant that there were a lot of splinters flying around French ships, killing people whereas the French went for the mobility kill, as we say in modern parlance, and they were shooting at sails, shooting at rigging, and they were not killing as many British sailors. In terms of ships, uh, 17 ships were taken, 17 Franco-Spanish ships were taken as, as prizes in the first instance. Uh, one ship blew up, the Achille, in, in the most spectacular fashion. Uh, but then a storm blew up on the, the night of the 21st of October and, and 13 of the prizes were, were actually lost. Uh, so this reduced uh, the, 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 the total bag to, to just four ships. Now, of the 27 British ships engaged in combat, about half were, were unserviceable on the evening of the 21st of October. So, so this was, was not a, a cheap victory but by any means. The French and the Spanish had fought extremely hard and had inflicted major damage on the ships of the Royal Navy. Following Trafalgar, Victory was severely damaged. She was then refitted, and she actually continued her working life until 1812. And during the period 1808 to 1812, she was used by Admiral Simarez uh, up in the Baltic. Then she returned to Portsmouth, where she was anchored as the Port Admiral's flagship until 1921, when she was brought into the dry dock where she currently stands. However, as then, she is now, and hopefully ever will be, a commissioned ship in the Royal Navy. And she is currently the oldest commissioned warship in the world, as notified by the flying of the White Ensign and a Royal Navy crew on board. Si bien el resultado de la batalla de Trafalgar fue estratégicamente decisivo, sus poderosos efectos en vencedores y vencidos fueron igualmente profundos. 
estableció a Gran Bretaña como la más importante potencia naval del mundo durante más de un siglo y convirtió a Nelson en una leyenda. Preservado en alcohol, su cuerpo fue llevado a Inglaterra, donde se le hizo un funeral de estado. El capturado Villeneuve fue repatriado un año después, solo para morir casi de inmediato por su propia mano en misteriosas circunstancias. It is often claimed that the Battle of Trafalgar saved Great Britain from the immediate danger of invasion. In fact, that was not the case. Napoleon had called off the whole of the invasion preparations as soon as he learned that Admiral Villeneuve had entered Cadiz some time before. And indeed, on the day of the Battle of Trafalgar, he was deep in Germany, involved in the Ulm campaign. So there's no question of it saving Britain from immediate invasion. Other historians have pointed out that uh, Trafalgar did not actually stop the French shipbuilding program, and that indeed by 1814 that the French Navy was, was much more powerful than it had been in 1805, and, and indeed was beginning to, to equal the Royal Navy in strength. Now, having said all that, uh, it, it's easy to actually minimize the, the, the Battle of Trafalgar and its impact on, on European history. But the fact, fact is that it, it had an, an enormous impact. Without a fleet, Bonaparte can't cross the Channel, Bonaparte can't invade Britain. Without a fleet, France cannot challenge the Royal Navy for dominance of the Mediterranean. So after Trafalgar, Britain is no longer worried about a French invasion. After Trafalgar, the Mediterranean Sea becomes an English lake. And after Trafalgar, France becomes a continental power. That means they cannot try to get colonies, they can't rely on colonies, they have to rely on just the resources that are in Europe. El sueño de Napoleón de invadir Inglaterra fue destruido para siempre, aunque la derrota no llegó a disminuir sus ambiciones. El despótico gobernante ya había alejado a su gran ejército de las costas del norte de Francia hacia Austria, donde la gloria de Austerlitz lo esperaba. El infortunado Villeneuve, quien expresó después de la batalla de Trafalgar que tanto valor merecía un mejor destino, supo resumir sabiamente la suerte de la armada de Napoleón, a la que se le había asestado un duro golpe.